Hi and welcome to this uh, lunch seminar. Um, I just want to tell you that this seminar is being filmed and uh, if you have any questions to the presenter you can uh, ask them at the end of the uh, seminar um, and then please raise your hands so I can go around with this microphone and uh, give you the words so you can ask Gabriel whatever questions you have. Um, now I'm going to leave the word to Gabriel Skanse who is going to talk about talking robots or social robots. So please, thank you. Thank you very much. Let's see if this works. Is it working? Or? Not a little. Not a little. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me here. So, uh, as uh, we heard, this talk is going to be about uh, robots that can speak to humans uh, and the science behind Furhat and what Furhat is, you will learn soon. Uh, <coughs> so, the idea of uh, talking to uh, machines is, uh, of course, not new. It, the idea has been around for some time, uh, of course, in science fiction. Uh, it's obvious that you talk to, to your machine or your robot. Um, and uh, of course in technology also in applications, uh, it has been around for, for some time. Uh, however, people haven't sort of, until recently I would say, haven't really sort of perceived this technology as, as uh, working or, or very well. So there are a lot of fun videos that you can find on YouTube of a speech recognition uh, system that fails. So this is one of them that I found quite funny. Uh, I will start by playing that. Open the pod bay doors, please, Tom. Searching for cod recipes online. Open the pod bay doors, please, Tom. Sorry, I can't find anyone named Rod K. More in your contacts. Open the pod bay doors, Tom. Sorry, I'm having trouble processing your request. <laughs> What's the problem? Problem Child is a 1990 comedy movie starring Michael Oliver. What are you talking about, huh? Playing Talking Heads on Spotify. I don't know what you're talking about, Hal. Here are a few popular halal restaurants. Big L's Pizzeria, Fatima's Halal Meat Market and Grill, Cedar's Halal Meat Market and Grill, and all Guadalajara... Where the hell did you get that idea, Hal? Searching for flights to Idaho. <laughs> How I won't argue with you anymore. Open the doors. Playing the doors on Spotify. Al? Al? You know that it would be Al. Yeah, so this is a not very nice editing mix of, of uh, the movie 2001 and, and what Alexa would respond. Uh, uh, but actually, Alex, I don't know how many of you have used uh, smart speakers. Uh, some of you. So they are extremely popular in the US. Uh, Amazon Echo and Google Home. It's a speaker you have in your home that you can ask to play music and you can ask it about the weather and so on. Um, they have Google Home was recently um, released in, in Sweden. Uh, I have one myself and they actually work very well. Uh, and if you look at the speech recognition performance, so speech recognition is turning speech into words. Uh, historically, uh, this has been a very, very tough problem. It is a very tough problem uh, for many reasons, because we all sound very differently. Uh, so it's very hard for a computer to understand words, even though it's extremely easy for us. Um, so this is the word error rate, it's the amount of errors you get uh, in the speech recognition on, this is conversational data, so it's human-human talking to each other, it's challenging speech to, to understand for a computer. Uh, and you get very high errors here back in the, in the 90s and, uh, and so on. Uh, but there were work, a lot of research was done to improve this, but still sort of it wasn't good enough uh, to be useful in applications. Uh, but very recently, uh, developments in, in uh, deep learning and access to bigger data sets has pushed 
this uh, error rate down to, to a level where it's actually becoming uh, to be very useful. So this is one quote um, that I think is true. As speech recognition accuracy goes from 95 to 99 percent, we'll go from barely using it to using it all the time. So from going to sort of below a certain threshold, it's, it's not very useful at all because there are too many errors, going to, to, to a state where it's extremely powerful uh, for many different reasons. Um, and we can sort of finally realize this dream of talking to your machine. And, and an area that, that uh, I am looking into a lot uh, for speech technology uh, is uh, robots or social robots. So the social robots are robots that you are supposed to interact with as opposed to more sort of traditional uh, robots in, in, for example, a factory, which you are not supposed to be near. Uh, it's supposed to do its thing. Uh, where a social robot, the pur main purpose is to interact with people in different ways, or the, where the interaction is important, at least. So, of course, in healthcare, you have these robots that can do heavy lifting, uh, manufacturing, uh, where you can sort of show the robot how to do certain uh, parts of the work uh, by just grabbing the arm and so on. So, so far, you cannot really talk to these machines or these robots, but of course, it would be extremely powerful if you could. So there is a lot of research on how you, you should be able to do that. So it would be much easier to instruct a robot, of course, if you could not just only show, but also tell uh, at the same time. Uh, so these are sort of more traditional robots in the sense that they actually do physical work. Uh, but there is another sort of type of robots uh, that we see over here uh, on the right side. And these are robots that don't actually do any physical work. Uh, the only purpose of them is for you to, to talk to them, basically, or interact with them. Uh, so even though this pepper robot here has arms, the arms cannot do anything useful. They are mainly co for communicative purpose, like pointing, for example. Uh, and this is Furhat that I will talk more about. This a robot developed uh, here at KTH and now further developed in a company, Furhat Robotics, that I was part of co-founding. Um, and... Uh, they could be used in many different uh, settings, for example, public spaces that we see here. You could go to the robot and ask for something. Uh, it could be used in education, like you see here, uh, playing games, learning things, and so on with this robot. So then, of course, the question is, why, why having a robot here? If it doesn't do anything, if you're only talking to it, couldn't you just have a voice like the smart speaker I was talking about? or maybe an agent on a screen at least? Why would you have a robot? Or are these even robots? Um, and I would argue that uh, first, the, the, there is a big difference. And yes, uh, there is a, a sense in which it, it's, uh, you can refer to them as robots. Uh, <clears throat> so let's look at the difference. What's the difference of talking to your phone, for example, like Siri in the iPhone? Uh, and talking to a robot like this in this kind of setting. Um, so one way of looking at it is to compare what's the difference of talking to someone over the phone and talking to someone in this kind of situation. And most people experience that this is a much, much more powerful setting for communication than this is. And people are even willing to travel long distances in order to get this kind of interaction. Even though they could have picked up the phone or they could have called on Skype and talk instead. Uh, so in a similar way, there is something very powerful in this setting that we don't have here. Um, and what is that? Well, first, uh, we have, of course, the faces here uh, that are extremely important for communication. Faces carry a lot of information. I will talk more about that. Uh, but it's also what we call a situated interaction. So the interaction takes place in a situation where you might, for example, have things on the table that you point at and that you talk about. Uh, also, people are situated. So the people taking part in the interaction are situated, which means that it's much easier to handle uh, turn-taking, knowing who is supposed to speak, who is addressing whom, and so on. And everyone who had, had tried to have a multi-party conversation over Skype know that it's, it's very painful. Uh, whereas we don't think this is painful. Um, so again, this applies to human-robot interaction as well. We can have a multi-part interaction with several people talking to the robot without sort of uh, this confusion that you get 
uh, in these settings on the left. Um, so what, why is the face important? So first of all, uh, face has been shown to, to create a much more engaging ex uh, sort of interaction. Uh, it's much more fun uh, and interesting. You have a feeling of presence. You have a feeling that the one you are interacting with is there in the room. Uh, and this has been shown to actually affect, uh, for example, in educational settings, that the learning uh, rate is increased if you have a physical agent rather than sort of an agent on a screen. And as I, as I said before, it's situated. If we look at these as sort of uh, the face as an output device or an input device, <laughs> in the sense that, let's say that the robot has a face, uh, then it's the output of the system to the user, right? Uh, so the system can now show its attention. So is it looking at something we are talking about? Is it looking at a specific person? Or is it just looking around at everyone? Uh, so this we can see from the robot, uh, from the robot's gaze. Uh, we can also, of course, interpret the robot's facial expressions to see if it's uncertain, if it's happy or sad, uh, or doesn't understand what you're saying. Um, and also lip movements are important. Uh, so lip movements actually uh, enhance speech comprehension, even if you're not hearing impaired. Uh, it has been shown in, in research that lip movements does uh, improve speech comprehension for, for everyone. Um, if in input, let's say the robot has a camera and can see the people uh, that are talking to it, then the, well, then the robot can more easily detect who is talking to the robot and who is not talking to the robot. That's very hard for a smart speaker. <coughs> If it yet hears a voice in the room, it wouldn't know if it's me talking to someone or if it's me talking to the device. So that's why I always have to say, hey, Google, in order for my smart speaker to understand that I'm talking to it. Uh, here you could see that from the face. Uh, speaker recognition, of course, we could recognize more easily people uh, if they come back, for example. Uh, we can read their facial expressions. We can read their attention, of course. Are people attending the robot or are they attending something else, someone else? So it's a lot of information in, this, uh, in the face that we can utilize. So if we look at the sort of uh, different attempts at giving the machine a face or giving robots a face, uh, we can see that, for example, uh, it, it very often looks like this. Uh, and then I would say that the face is very much neglected. Uh, so the, the designer here didn't perhaps think that the face was very important for communication. It doesn't have any lip movements, it doesn't have any facial expressions. It's very hard to read the gaze apart from sort of the head uh, rotation. Um, there are more abstract robots uh, like Jibo here, uh, where you don't really try to mimic a human face. You just try to uh, create something that still has expressions. but. The advantage of a face, of course, is that we already know how to interpret faces. Uh, so uh, we don't have to sort of learn a new set of expressions. Then we have these kind of robots that uh, Sophia here, uh, which has been around a lot in the, in the media. And these, of course, when we look at the still image like this, it looks extremely human-like. Uh, the problem is when it starts to move or uh, tries to move because the movements doesn't match the appearance uh, because of this mechatronic uh, design. It's extremely hard uh, to sort of mimic all the uh, muscles that we actually have in the face that makes our uh, movements look the way they do. So typically this gives an impression of, of, of what we call the uncanny valley. That is, you get this sort of zombie effect, I would call it, uh, that uh, feels creepy. Um, and, of course, it's very expensive also uh, to manufacture. Um, and then we have uh, agents on screens, like this one, uh, with uh, computer animation. And that's, of course, uh, not... People typically don't think they are uncanny. Uh, there we can easy, more easily match the appearance and the movement of the face, thanks to, to the computer animation. Um, uh, the problem with these faces is that you get what we call the Mona Lisa effect. So here, the agent is, uh, when the agent is looking sort of in the camera, so to speak, like a newsreader, uh, everyone in the room will feel like um, this uh, newsreader is looking at you, which is great, because that's how you want to have it uh, when you watch, watch the news. Uh, but it doesn't work so well for interaction, right? Because you don't want the robot to either look at everyone or look at nobody, which is the effect 
uh, on a flat screen. Uh, so the robot wouldn't be able to sort of address a specific person in the room. Uh, it would either address everyone or nobody, uh, which is not the case for, for, for physical uh, robot heads. So we were thinking about sort of how to combine the best of, of the, the advantages of computer animation that I talked about and the advantages of a physical 3D appearance. Uh, and the idea was to, to project this 3D animation on a 3D printed mask that has the same shape as the fa uh, 3D face. Uh, you get something like this, and uh, then you can have exclusive mutual gaze, you can have uh, a lot of sort of very detailed facial expressions and, and, and eye movements and so on. Uh, you can, we also put it on a neck, and uh, so it can move the head uh, and the eyes sort of irrespective of each other. Um, and then we put a fur hat on it because things were sticking out, as you can see here. Uh, so we wanted to cover it up and it also got this sort of soft, nice uh, feeling to it that robots otherwise typically don't have. Um, and people like this, they thought also it was associated with this Scandinavian uh, feeling, so, so that was good for, for marketing. And, and then people started to ask, could we actually buy this robot? And we said, no, it's just... Uh, it's just a research project, uh, but then we thought that, well, maybe people should be able to buy it. So we started a company to, to produce these robots and uh, sort of both the hardware and the software platform for it. Um, so that, that was in 2014, and now the company uh, has around 20 people uh, employed sitting here at KTH, um, and I'm, I'm still involved in the company. Um, and uh, just a few weeks ago, we, we uh, released a new version of the robot that looks like this, uh, that we have been working on for like two years, uh, which uh, with a much more sort of professional hardware and, and improved software and with integrated sensors and so on. Um, so, uh, this is a, an, a video showing Furhat in a, in a use case. We have a couple of sort of inspiration videos uh, that will sort of give ideas about how could this technology be used. ¿Dónde Lo tiene a su derecha, en el andén 3. No se preocupe, tardará dos minutos en llegar. El tren sale dentro de seis minutos. Ay, qué bien, ¿eh? Muchísimas gracias. Tal vez debería irme a casa contigo. ¿En serio? Siempre quise un anillo de compromiso. Les deseo un buen viaje. ¿Te estás coqueteando con mi mujer? No. No, pero... Join us in creating a world where technology is more human. So that's uh, that's this inspiration video, and actually, it's not so far from from uh, uh, what we tried this spring. We had a setting in uh, Frankfurt Airport where Furhat was um, uh, sitting as a uh, concierge and uh, asking questions. And you can see that there are examples of things you can ask it, like is Wi-Fi available? Where is my gate? It could speak both English and, and, and German. Um, and um, yeah, although it might, it didn't really be uh, yet be able to handle this kind of complex multi part interaction. But that's something we are working on. I will show you more uh, on, on that uh, part later. So, just to, to tell you a little bit about how we work with, with a conversation in, in, or how we develop conversations. So, conversations can look very different depending on the, on the application. Uh, so, this is, this is an example of a, of a robot selling hamburgers. 
Uh, it's quite similar kind of application that we have uh, in the airport. It's mainly providing information or sort of asking for information uh, and trying to sort of come up with uh, uh, performing some order or something. Um, uh, so someone is saying, may I, uh, well, the, someone is approaching the robot says, may I please take your order? I would like a cheeseburger. Do you want anything to drink? Yes, a large milkshake and some fries. What flavor do you want in your milkshake? What options are there? You can choose between strawberry, chocolate, banana and vanilla. Then I take a Coke. What size do you want for your fries? You know, forget about it. Okay, I'm canceling your order. So this is actually a little bit tricky to handle these kind of conversations because it's a lot of contexts on different levels in here that we are trying to model. Uh, so typically we try to, to, to define these different contexts and, and typically there is an overall context of sort of ordering a burger and then there are more narrow contexts of talking about, for example, uh, which flavor we want in, in the milkshake. Uh, and then we typically structure them like this uh, in sort of a hierarchical structure. Uh, where the robot is idle or, or is taking an order, it's requesting a drink, it's requesting the flavor of the drink, and so on. And then we're trying to define what will happen when the user does something, when something happens, depending on these contexts. Um, so, for example, if we are in the request flavor, uh, strawberry is, is, is a meaningful utterance, right? But we are, if we are here, request side order, if someone just says strawberry, uh, sort of the size of the side order, and someone says strawberry doesn't make sense in this context. So in different contexts, different utterances make sense. Uh, what options are there are actually valid in both when we're talking about the flavor and the size of the side order here, as you can see. And some things like forget about it is actually valid throughout this whole order, regardless of which state we're in. Or a thing like what did you say is, is also a more general. Uh, so this is how we approach these kind of dialogues, where we try to identify this hierarchy of, of, of different states, and wherever we, in each state we are, we try to sort of see what of these different things that we have in the current sort of uh, hierarchy of context uh, uh, should the robot respond to. And that creates sort of a very flexible uh, dialogue, and we try to classify utterances uh, using machine learning uh, for this. Uh, so that's very briefly. I can also mention uh, another type of dialogue that we are working on, which is quite different, is this one. So we have a project where we work uh, to create a robot that can do uh, job interviews together with a, uh, a recruitment firm called TNG in Stockholm. Um, so the idea is that the robot will not do the whole recruitment process, obviously, but it will do one interview that has to do with a person's personality. So it will actually conduct an interview asking fairly open-ended questions uh, like, uh, uh, can you tell me about on your, uh, on your last workplace some, some problems you were in? And of course that would trigger a much longer, sort of more open-ended uh, answer than in the, in the burger ordering. Uh, and the robot will ask questions, uh, will, will give feedback uh, and ask follow-up questions and so on. And this is much trickier to, to, to model. We can't really do it in the same way as, as the burger order. Uh, so here we are trying another approach uh, where we are uh, letting the robot, this schematically, uh, the user is talking to the robot uh, and doing the interview, but uh, actually there is a human in, the, in, a, in another room uh, controlling the robot. So the human uh, has a set of buttons that, that the human can press uh, in order to make the robot say things. Um, and uh, then, of course, these buttons might change depending on sort of where, where still the state of the dialogue we are. Um, and the idea with this is that we, we collect data, so we will collect around 150 of these interactions. Um, and then we can use this data to train a machine learning uh, a machine learning problem uh, uh, classifier to, to, to uh, understand when should uh, the robot sort of press the button uh, and which button should, should it press. That is, what should it say, when should it say something using this data. And that decision could of course be based both on, on uh, the speech, what did the person say, uh, but it could also be f uh, based on, on facial expressions and, and, and things like that. 
Um, so that, that's sort of a, a different approach to it. Uh, this is another type of interaction that I just want to show, just because to understand sort of the breadth of the possible applications for this kind of technology. Uh. Young lady, I'm here to return these shoes. I'm not happy. Okay, ma'am. Um, and what seems to be the problem with them? My feet hurt like hell. Your idiotic manager over there, he told me that these shoes were comfortable. Well, they're not. These shoes are dreadful. Um, well, these are a bit worn out. Do you have your receipt with you? Even the color is hideous. In fact, these are not my taste at all. Okay. Well, can I please have the receipt, ma'am? Right under your eyes. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah. Um, well, okay, we have a 30-day money-back guarantee, but you bought this three months ago, so I'm very sorry, but I cannot give this, I cannot take this back. I am a regular, very well-respected customer here, and you should treat me that way. I can't take this back for you. Ignorant child. I, I can't help you for being disrespectful to me like this. You're being very if unreasonable. If you don't make the exchange, I... You did really well, Angela. <laughs> but you can't tell the customers that they're unreasonable. No, okay. No. So try not to lose your cool next time, okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Farad, uh, let's try another scenario. Okay. Uh, let's do the one where the customer has a stolen credit card. You got it. Okay. What do you mean this credit card is not working? So this is another type of application, as you can see, where the robot is not uh, ordering, uh, sort of serving burgers or anything, but we're using the robot to simulate uh, a human in order for a training scenario. Uh, and there are many different kinds of training. This, this could be one, but we have other uh, sort of projects with, with training scenarios, like someone learning to become a doctor or a psychologist, uh, and you want to train your interview, uh, or your, you want to train uh, the, the conversation you would have with a patient on, on the robot. And then, of course, this flexible uh, face that we have with the, with the facial uh, the projection, of course, helps a lot uh, with different voices in order to create different per personalities for the robot. And it's a case where, of course, again, the face becomes uh, very important. Uh, so this is... Uh, uh, now we're going into to, to the sort of talk a little bit about uh, the multi-party interaction with robots. Um, so uh, we, we saw that in the video uh, at the train station, uh, the inspiration video. Uh, and that, that's, um, of course, as I also mentioned in the, in the beginning of the talk, that's uh, a kind of a situation where having a physical agent or having a physical situation is really valuable. Uh, so this is a setting that we had at the Technical Museum in Stockholm. Um, where we uh, designed a game that uh, the robot could play together with two persons here. Um, and, and the idea with the game is that you have a set of cards on this digital table that you're supposed to sort. It could be card, it could be, for example, here are buildings that you're supposed to sort uh, depending on how, how tall they are. It could be animals based on how fast they can run and so on. Themes that are good with children, uh, obviously. Um, and the idea is that we designed the robot here to not sort of uh, have all the answers uh, to this. So it's, it's the purpose of the robot is not that you should ask it and it should give you the answer. Uh, so we have programmed the robot to actually not know the answer, uh, but have an idea about the answer. So similar, it's actually a symmetrical setting in the sense, as you can see. There are actually three persons sitting here trying to play this game together and discuss the solution together. So that's quite different, perhaps, from how we otherwise see robots. Um, and this, having this at, at the museum created a, a very good opportunity for collecting data, of course. So we uh, gathered around 400 interactions uh, with Farhat, with uh, children and adults in different combinations and so on, where we could study multi-party interaction between humans uh, and a robot. Um, so in order to do this kind of interaction, it's very important that the robot has a clear understanding of the situation, since we're talking about situated interaction. Uh, so we are using different sensors. Uh, so, so here, for example, we, we use the Kinect here, 
uh, which is a sensor from Microsoft that can track the bodies of people. Uh, it can pick audio from different directions using multiple microphone arrays. Uh, and uh, of course, this table, digital table, gives the system knowledge about where the cards are located. And it's merging all this information into a top, this is the top view of the situation, as you can see, with the tables and the cards and the people. Um, uh, and, and, the, and this helps Furhat, of course, to understand where objects are located, where are people uh, attending, uh, who is speaking, and who is speaking to whom, and so on. We also, as you can see here, try to estimate the head pose of the people as some kind of, of proxy for, for their gaze. So where are they attending? Um, and that, of course, helps Furhat to, to, to uh, sort of uh, manage the, the behavior of Furhat. And so this is a video uh, of, of what the interaction looks like uh, where, with some internal things <coughs> happening. Um, this is me and a colleague and uh, from, from Furhat's perspective, the camera, and this is Furhat, and this is the situation view that I talked about. The other parts are not so important, so you can uh, try to focus on, on these first. I den här omgången ska vi sortera de här länderna efter hur många guldmedaljer i OS de har. Det är med minst antal guldmedaljer här. Och det är med flest guldmedaljer här borta. Vilket Så. land tycker ni att vi ska börja med? Det är sommar och vinter OS då. Mm. Mm. Jag har hört att Italien har många guld i fäktning och cykling. Ja, ja men de är väl ganska mm. bra, är de inte det? Kanske jag ska lägga mig här borta. Kanske. Men mm. Danmark vet jag inte hur bra de är. Ja. We, we don't hear his voice here because it's mm. It's only have one channel. Men Finland har väl mycket. Är inte Finland bra på vintersport? Finland har ju mycket snö, ja. så de borde vara bra på vintersport. Ja, jag tycker också det. Vi lägger dem ganska högt här borta. Men kanske inte lika högt mm. som Italien. Danmark kanske. Jag tycker också att det verkar bättre att ta Finland där. Ja, det tycker jag också. Mm -hmm. Jag tycker att det verkar rimligt att Finland har färre medaljer än Italien. Vad tror ni? Färre alltså fler mindre. Mm. Mm. Vad tror du om Grekland och Portugal då? Är det... Jag tror att Portugal har ganska få medaljer. Det kortet borde kanske ligga längst här borta. Ja, kanske. Tror jag att de har färre än Grekland? Mm. Nej. Nu tycker jag det ser lite bättre ut. Ja. Men vad tror du? Är vi klara sådär eller? Mm. Ja. Okej, okay. är det här vår slutgiltiga gissning? Ja, det tror jag. Vi kollar. Uh... Ja. Wow! Alla rätt. Ja. Jag trodde att Grekland har fler medaljer än Danmark. Men det var fel. Ja, det var tur att vi inte nu lyssnade på det. Nu har vi spelat dig. två omgångar. Ja. Kanske det finns andra som vill prova. Kanske. Tack så mycket för att. Tack. So as I said, we, we didn't hear uh, his voice here because of, of, of the audio, but you get an idea here of, of the sort of uh, the challenge here of, of, uh, of many things, of course, but one of them being uh, for Furha to know uh, when it's his turn to speak and, uh, and not. Um, so uh, some words about, about uh, turn taking in conversation. So this is something that uh, we have looked at quite a lot in our research. Um, and uh, of course there has been a lot of study in the linguistics and so on, on uh, studying people uh, in turn taking and understanding how people uh, manage this. Um, and, and what people find in these kind of studies is something very interesting and that is that uh, the gap between turns when you speak is typically very, very short. Uh, so this is a histogram of, of the gap length. The negative means that there is an overlap, uh, and positive here is, is, uh, uh, is a gap. 
and the modal response time is about around 200 milliseconds. And that's close to human sort of reaction time, uh, which is a bit odd because when you take the turn, not only had you, it's not like pressing a button, it's actually saying something, th thinking about what should you respond. So uh, the idea is that people, of course, while this person is speaking, this person is, is thinking about what to say and trying to project when is it my turn to speak uh, and trying to find that, that spot. Because it's also the case that people pause, make pauses in utterances, of course. So just because there is a silence, 200 milliseconds, if we would barge in as soon as there was a 200 milliseconds silent, we would be interrupting each other all the time, right? Uh, so that's not how it works. Um, so how is it coordinated? So, so studies have shown that uh, people use a lot of different signals to show that uh, they want to sort of hand over the turn to the other person or keep the turn, so yielding or holding. Um, and for example, syntactically, if you have a phrase, if, if you have a complete phrase, you're typically more likely to have finished if you're in the middle of a phrase. Like, like if I say, uh, last ni uh, night I went to uh, and make a pause, you would understand that I'm not finished, right? Uh, but also other things like prosody, so uh, that is the tone of, the, of my voice. Uh, so if I have a flat tone, uh, I'm more likely to, to be holding the turn than if I have a rising or falling. Uh, breathing, of course, if I breathe in, it's more likely that I'm about to say something. Gaze, if I look away, I'm more likely to want to continue speaking than if I look up at the other person. And gestures also, if I'm in the middle of a gesture, I might be more likely that, I, that I'm actually uh, going to continue. And studies have shown, uh, this is back in the 70s, so uh, that, that the more cues you, you have sort of uh, together, the, the stronger the signal is, of course. Um, and, of course, then the interesting question is, can computers uh, do this also? Um, and I'll get to that, but also sort of as a complicating factors, uh, this is just whether you are sort of holding or yielding the turn, but it's also a question of sort of in a multi-part interaction. Uh, if someone is speaking, uh, we, of course, have to sort of ask ourselves, are they yielding or not? If not, we sort of continue uh, speaking here. If they are yielding, uh, we have to ask ourselves, is the current speaker selecting who is the next speaker? Uh, and that you can do by either looking at someone or saying their name or pointing at them, for example. And then that uh, shifts. But it could also be that it's, it's, uh, they are not selecting uh, the next one. Uh, they are leaving it open for anyone to respond. So if I look at... Uh, uh, in the game, and I, I just look at one of the cards and say, that one looks uh, like we should move that one. It's not obvious who would take the turn. Um, so then we have this self-selection. Uh, and this, of course, happens in this card game. That's uh, what's very nice about it, so, so we can see how, how the robot sort of can utilize these different turn shifts, like uh, having self-selection by looking at both people, looking at the cards, or selecting the next speaker by looking at them. And then, of course, the user does the same thing. So they might be looking at the cards, they might be looking at Furhat to select Furhat as the next speaker, or looking at each other to select uh, the other person as the next speaker. Um, so then, of course, from Furhat's perspective, this creates sort of a, a whole spectrum of, uh, uh, of, of a decision of, it's, is it my turn to speak or not, which is sort of not really binary, but it's more like, Either it's a very bad place to take the turn. Someone just made a pause, for example. You shouldn't just barge in. Uh, or you're obliged to take the turn because someone asked a question and looked at you. Uh, and then, of course, there are uh, sort of things in between. So these are annotations from a human looking at the videos from first perspective and trying to annotate uh, these sort of uh, these, these values. And then what we did was to look at, can we put this into a model uh, so that uh, we can see if someone says, yeah, um, we should learn that this is a don't, don't take the turn here. If someone says like this uh, and looks at the card, uh, we can say this is an opportunity to take the turn. Uh, this is possible, but it's not necessary. Uh, and then when they look up at Furat and say, what do you think? Uh, we have an obligation to take the turn. Uh, and then we can use all these multimodal uh, uh, information that we have from the sensors in order to make this decision. 
so we take this annotation that we, we, we did on the data and we learn uh, a machine learning classifier to try to, to understand uh, how the robot should act. So if we just to help post, this is the F-score uh, uh, of the classifier, we get 0 0.7. If we add prosody, that is the tone of the voice of the speakers, uh, we actually get a bit more uh, performance. And if we add the other things, like the words they are speaking, the movement of the cards, are they currently sort of in the middle of a movement? And the dialogue history, which is what did the robot say last? Uh, we get an even better performance, as you can see there, but 0 0.85. Uh, so this really confirms these sort of studies that uh, were done in the 70s, but they, they were not sort of using machine learning back then, uh, and they did not use robots. Uh, but it's nice to see that we can actually use these for robots to understand uh, how they should act in this kind of, of uh, inter multi party interaction. Uh, so I think I will end there. Uh, and uh, see if you might have any questions. Okay. Yes. You're supposed to be able to throw this, but I am not so. Um, hey, I have a question. Uh, Concerning the UN development goals and um, the goals at KTH, we try to find, we are aiming at um, equality. And I would like to ask you, how come that the salesperson is a woman and the boss is a man? And also, you have a situation, two persons are discussing uh, the sports, they are both men. I think in a gender perspective, maybe one could reconsider that. or. <laughs> What do you say? Uh, so the two males talking to, to the robot there, I guess it was me and my colleague uh, you were referring to, or, or uh, but I, I should say on, on that note that uh, uh, we did a quite thorough study on, on uh, gender effects in, in multi-party turn-taking uh, using this data. So since we did it at the museum, we had, um, as I said, around 400 participants. Uh, uh, or, or pairs of speakers of different uh, gender and different ages. Uh, and we were interested in to see how the gender and age combination affects uh, who takes the turn in the conversation uh, and to study these effects. So if you're interested in that, we have a paper uh, that describes these uh, age and gender effects uh, on the interaction. More questions? Yes. Ah. Okay. <coughs> Are you good at that, Skettler? Oops. Does it still work? Uh, okay. So uh, my question is, uh, what is the biggest challenge uh, to have a truly kind of human-level dialogue system? Uh, yeah, there are a lot of challenges, of course, and it, also, it depends a lot. I mean, all, all the situations that I've shown so far are sort of limited domains. So we are either playing a game, we are uh, selling burgers, or we are performing a job interview. That's quite open, but it's not extremely open. You wouldn't talk about anything in a job interview. Uh, so, of course, that's, I would say, is, the, is, is perhaps the biggest challenge. How can you make a system that could have a much broader sort of, could talk about anything basically uh, in the way that humans can. Uh, and that's sort of not really possible today or th there is no good solution to that. So, uh, and the reason for that is that, I mean, even as humans, uh, we do have, I talked about this context in, in the burger selling. We always have an understanding of the context and everything we see and hear, we interpret uh, in this context. Um, and since the system has a lot of, um, it's, it's a lot of sort of noise in there, and it's hard for the system to understand what people say and so on, it helps a lot to understand everything that is said in the context of this game. So even if you didn't hear what they said, you could guess that they were probably talking about that card or something. Um, so unless we have a very, very good uh, understanding of what's being said, 
we, we typically want this kind of constraint setting in order to be able to interpret what is said in this specific context. And that helps the system. Uh, so opening up to, to talk about anything, uh, I think, is, is one of the major challenges. Uh, but there are, of course, many, many of them. Uh, I mean, for example, this turn taking is not something that we have solved. It's still an extremely complicated uh, thing for, for machines to understand because it's sort of so many nuances to it. Mm -hmm. Another question? Yes. Uh, it was very interesting you um, um, explained uh, much about uh, the circumstances interaction, such as um, uh, when should the robot uh, say something, uh, when, the, when the audience turn nose or uh, watching some, 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 somewhere else. Uh, uh, it would be very interesting next time maybe you explain more about the language processing uh, when the audience uh, ask what should the, the robot um, answer or explain. So my, my question is uh, how, how much proportion um, between uh, like machine learning and hand engineering or uh, hard coding uh, in, the, in the language processing? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. And the answer is that it, it depends a lot on, on the application and, and the domain that we are working with. Uh, so this is a little bit what I try to also talk about here, that here is, it's a mix in the sense that we, in this burger ordering, we define this hierarchy of context and so on manually. So there's a designer coming up with this. This is what a burger ordering situation looks like. But then we collect examples of what people might say uh, in these different uh, settings. And then we use machine learning to try to classify. Because nobody will say exactly uh, like this, right? So they will say something similar to this. So we try to, to uh, understand uh, what they might have said by, by comparing these examples. So there we use more statistical approaches. So it's, it's really, in this case, a combination of sort of engineering and handcrafting and uh, more statistical and machine learning approaches. And I think that's sort of the way to go. It's also the, the, case, the problem is also that, as I t talked about in the recruitment thing, we, we had uh, the luxury of, of being able to perform these 150 or 200 interviews that we can do machine learning on. Uh, but that's not the luxury you typically have. So typically you have to start developing without all this data. And then it becomes very hard to do more sort of data-driven uh, modeling. Okay. Uh, second question. <laughs> Uh, so uh, I watched the Lear um, Wiesling for Uh, uh So um, I guess you, uh, the company is still um, under, under the period to, uh, to, uh, to get him profit, but uh, the company is still uh, losing money, uh, kind of losing money. So uh, do you guys have a plan uh, when uh, should the company get profit back? So. Actually, I think we were break even last year, but okay. uh, but uh, uh, yeah, it's it's uh, very challenging if you want to scale. It's it's very hard to 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 uh, make money in the beginning, of course. Uh, so now that we are scaling, that that's obviously not going to be possible for 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 some time. Uh, but uh, we are, I think, we are a bit sort of special in the sense that we have been selling our product from day one to companies and to researchers. Uh, and actually getting input from, from customers, uh, which is not often the case with like these more like tech startups. Mm. Mm. Thank you, Gabriel. Thank you. Uh, and if you have more questions on time, you can stay afterwards, but many people have to go to lectures. So thank you for listening to this very interesting seminar. Thank you. Thank you.